Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super Jcast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super Jcast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm -hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super Jcast for all all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings. I am doing a, what I think will be a short episode, kind of a breaking news episode related to the story that broke yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about Vince McMahon uh, being accused of sex trafficking, uh, which has obviously been all the talk of the wrestling world over the last 24 hours, and rightfully so. I am just popping on. I've got some thoughts on this story and wanted to record something on it. Um, I don't have a guest or anything, but figured I could just at least get my thoughts out and maybe some people will be interested in hearing them. Um, I'm recording this at 9.50 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, January 26th. Um, so there's obviously a lot that could come out between when I'm recording this and when people listen to this. Seems like an evolving situation, so... Keep that in mind when you listen to it. I'm also going to be discussing some of the details that were in um, the official court filing by the plaintiff. And those details are pretty graphic and they depict um, a really dark picture of sexual assault and rape and dehumanization. And if that's a trigger for anyone, I just want to be upfront about that and say, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So please keep that in mind. I wanted to start just with kind of a brief overview of what was actually in that legal filing. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have listened or, or read the Wall Street Journal story. Um, some of you maybe have even gone through the court filing. I, I Yesterday, I read all 67 pages in the court filing, and I kind of comprised a lot of the stuff that was in there. I'll, it, it, it's, it's actually significantly worse than what's in the Wall Street Journal article. The Wall Street Journal article is really just a very brief summary of what was in the court filing. But what is in the court filing is some really incredibly sinister stuff that I think really needs to be said out loud, even as, as troubling as it can be, because a lot of the times in this situation, we tend to maybe hand wave some of the stuff and just saying, well, Vince is a bad guy. Um, I know some people have said like, oh, well, I expected this because I know Vince is a scumbag. And um, I can't possibly be surprised by anything, almost kind of like it's a badge of honor. Like, well, my opinion of Vince was already so low that nothing could possibly surprise me. I mean, good for you if that's true, I guess. Um, and, and and trust me, my opinion of Vince McMahon was already pretty low, as pretty much all of my listeners or anyone that's ever read any of my articles would, would understand. Um, but even I was was pretty surprised by some of the stuff that's in this court filing. Um, and, and of course, you know, the court filing is done by the plaintiff, so it's coming from that perspective. Um, so I think that's, you know, you got to be mindful of that. I personally pretty much believe everything that's in there, but it is, you know, one person's side of things. And I'm not saying that that person is a liar or anything like that, because I don't believe that they're a liar, but it's also something that we should probably at least keep in mind. But what's in this um what's in this court filing is you know there's this woman 
who um, was a caregiver for her parents and her parents uh, passed away. And she had spent a lot of time as a caregiver that she didn't have really any job opportunities. And this is a significant problem that a lot of people face, people that step away from the workforce or they spend their lives in a certain role taking care of a sick family member. And while they're doing that, they lose a lot of life skills and experience that other people would normally gain because their lives are consumed by the selfless act of taking care of a loved one. And this woman in this this court case, this court filing, after her parents passed away, she was looking for a job and she didn't really have a lot of job prospects because she hadn't been a member of the workforce. And she ends up getting introduced to Vince because I guess this woman was close to the residence manager at the, the condo complex she was living in. And it was the same condo complex that Vince was living in. And this residence manager introduces this woman to Vince you know, knowing that Vince is, you know, a very successful business uh, entrepreneur and that maybe he could help her find a job. And basically what this is devolves into is Vince promising and eventually giving this woman uh, a high paying job that she didn't really feel like she was qualified for uh, in return for sexual favors and eventually really devolving into this woman being Vince McMahon's personal sex slave. Um, and the, the court case makes it very clear that the woman did not want to do any of this, but because she didn't have any real employment opportunities and pretty much from the get go, Vince started threatening her um, with, you know, her silence and things like that. Vince said, uh, you know, according to the court case, Vince said, you know, I have the best legal team and they can make anyone go away. That starts to be a problem. Um, so this woman fell into this relationship. With Vince, and there's so much horrible stuff in here. Um, I'm going to go over some of the, the more troubling stuff, I guess, just because I feel like it needs to be said. There's a story about this woman being pressured into having a three-way with Vince McMahon and another person. And Vince McMahon shits on this woman's face uh, during the start of the three-way. And then Vince leaves to go take a shower while this woman is forced to continue to have sex with the other person in the three-way while she has feces in her hair. Um, there's a story in here about Vince violently raping this woman with dildos and different sex toys. Sex toys that he named after WWE wrestlers, like he had a black dildo. And he named it after a black WWE wrestler. And if he had a white dildo, he named it after a white WWE wrestler. And if he had a smaller dildo, it was named after one of the smaller performers on WWE's roster. Um, he he arranged for her to basically have a sex schedule with, with John Laurinaitis. Um, basically pawned her off to Johnny Ace. He used her as a bargaining chip in uh, trying to recruit Brock Lesnar back to WWE. He basically said that I'm trying to resign this guy. And part of that is you're going to have to have sex with him. And, and he's going to ask for stuff. I guess he asked for a, a video of her urinating, which I believe they sent. Um, so just really, really horrible stuff. I mean, when I was talking about this with other people yesterday who didn't, really know any of the details they just said like oh what's going on with Vince McMahon I mean I described it as just saying think about the worst thing someone could do to another person and it's worse than that because it is um I mean this was this was 67 pages worth of that kind of detail that I just shared so that's what we're talking about here we're not talking about, you know, a guy that kind of, you know, had sex with an employee. We're not even talking about a guy that kind of pressured a woman that worked underneath him to have sex with him, you know, once or twice or just to kind of have a little sex on the side or whatever. We're talking about someone that actively worked to dehumanize 
another person, someone who was in a difficult spot and felt like they had no other choice but to go along with this thing. And we're talking about, that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about like just a little sexual impropriety in the work workplace. We're talking about human trafficking. Like it says, we're talking about pawning her off onto other people, including John Laurinaitis. We're talking about um, using her as a tool to try to recruit at least Brock Lesnar. Um, and that's the thing about this story that we have is we have an instance where Vince McMahon had met this person, had used his power to pressure this person into doing these things. And it leads to a lot of questions about other potential people and other potential victims. My guess is that Vince McMahon did not start this behavior when he was 75 years old. We know that he's been involved in a lot of stuff in the past. Talk about the Reader Chatterton thing, which dates back to the mid 80s. Um, this is not a habit that I, I believe that Vince developed very late in life. This is probably something that's been going on for a long time. And there's unfortunately probably other people like this poor woman that's the plaintiff in this suit. Uh, and we know that like Vince was pawning her off with John Laurinaitis. We know that Vince wanted to use her as a tool to recruit Brock Lesnar. Ooh. That opens the door for all other possibilities. Is, is Was Brock Lesnar the only wrestler that was approached like, oh, if you re-sign with us, you can have sex with this woman? Um, It wouldn't surprise me if there's other major free agents that have had that similar proposition given to them. I don't want to speculate on anyone else in particular, but you know, Brock Lesnar is a big star that WWE wanted to sign and want to re-sign. There's a lot of people out there that WWE has wanted to do that with. And... Does that mean that those other people were approached with similar arrangements? Is that something just special for Brock? You know, the rules don't really apply to Brock. So it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if it's just something special for Brock, but it also wouldn't surprise me. And certainly it bears asking the question is, has this arrangement been, been made to any other talents that WWE has tried to recruit? Has, you know, this, you know, Vince's personal sex slave was was has that has that person been presented to other WWE executives, not just John Laurinaitis? Um, and how far have those people gone go along along with that? Um, it doesn't seem like it's probably a one time thing. It's probably happened many times before with many different people. So that's a major question that can be asked. And one of the things would be as this this court case is this uh, the plaintiff. You know, coming forward with all these allegations, does that open the door for other people to also come along and make similar allegations? Because, again, it seems unlikely that she is the only person that's been involved in this. Um, a big question I have about this and something that I think is, is going to take up a lot of the oxygen here is that Vince is probably screwed. Vince is probably not going to be making many public appearances after this. Maybe he will. Maybe this will all be water on the bridge in a few days. But but I think at least in terms of what potential consequences can we see, I think, and we already kind of saw this by TKO's statement saying that Vince holds no real, you know, control or authority um, over WWE, which is, is over TKO, which is probably not really true because he's still, I think, on their board of directors and he's still officially president uh, a, a president of TKO. So, I mean, I, I think he does have some authority. So I don't really believe that statement that they sent out. Um, but that's kind of beside the point. I think I think you know they'll bury Vince. They'll they'll you know they'll leave him out to dry. They'll I think the public statement won't be this is a Vince issue and a Johnny Laurinaitis issue. Both of who have nothing to do with the day to day operations of our company. So we're good. But. I think people like Paul Levesque and I think people like Nick Khan, I think their hands are definitely bloody. I think that it would be incredibly naive to assume that they didn't know anything about this. If you read the court filing, there's things like Vince really, you know, one of the main takeaways from the court filing is that Vince really kind of got off on telling other people about this woman that he had. There's stories about Vince 
you know, showing nude pictures of this woman to members of the raw tech crew uh, backstage. There's obviously he was telling John Laurinaitis all about it. It would seem very hard for me to believe that other high ranking executives in the company had absolutely no idea this was going on. And there's a lot of defense out there for Paul Levesque because a lot of people right now enjoy the WWE programming that Paul Levesque has been providing. And I think they're really allowing that to cloud their judgment and wanted to make it seem like, well, this is a Vince issue. It's not a Paul Levesque issue. He's not directly named in the court case or the Wall Street Journal story. He, you know, he, how can you, you can't really blame him for it. And I think that's total bullshit. I think that every single person that's on the, the that was on the WWE board of directors um, deserves a lot of blame for this. One of the things in the court case that's really interesting is that when in 2022, when Vince was resigned and they did a, a, a probe of Vince's actions um, and they, you know, concluded their probe in November of 2022, the, according to the court filing by the plaintiff, the WWE investigation team never reached out to the victim, never reached out to this person who was the re reason that Vince really had to resign from his position. Um, so, so they basically ran the sham probe. Um, and every single person that's on WWE board of directors deserves responsibility for that. They ran a fake probe that wasn't really interested in talking to the victim or really getting to the bottom of this. Clearly they weren't interested in getting to the bottom of this because we're getting a story in January, 2024 that's blowing this thing wide open again. So they totally deserve blame for that, at least not to mention the fact that they probably knew about this. I feel like I'm Mark Ruffalo in Spotlight when I'm talking to some of these people. You know that scene in Spotlight where Mark Ruffalo is talking about uh, how they need to to run the story on the, the priest scandal because of how so many people knew about this and they allowed it to happen. And Mark Ruffalo screams. He goes, they knew. They knew and they let it happen. That's the way I feel about Paul Levesque and Nick Khan and Stephanie McMahon. And all of these people that were on the WWE board and all these people that were backstage that probably knew about this. They knew about it and they let it happen because they were afraid of Vince and they were, wanted to keep their positions. Paul Levesque originally voted to not allow Vince back on the board of directors because he knew. He knew what this guy was. And then Vince, you know, threatened to, to mess up their TV deal if he wouldn't be brought back on. And oh, our hands were tied. Welcome back, Vince. I'll give credit to Stephanie McMahon. She resigned. Paul Levesque's wife resigned. Probably because she didn't want to work with Vince. Because she knew. But Paul Levesque could be head of creative in WWE. He saw that opportunity and said, you know what? Vince can come back. I can't lose my position. I don't want to resign my position because I could be head of creative. Let's let Vince back on. Whatever. He wants to play hardball. Let's let him back on. As long as I don't lose my position. And so, yeah, he deserves a lot of the blame. In a just world, he'll be going down too. But unless this story really impacts WWE's bottom line, unless it impacts corporate sponsors and their television partners, most notably Netflix. Probably not going to happen. Probably. I think they'll, 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 they'll wash their hands of Vince and, you know, the same people will remain in power. Um, even if uh, they deserve to go down, it's just the world we live in, unfortunately, but I'm really going to push back against this whole idea that Paul Levesque didn't know what was going on and that he can't blame him. You know, that that just because Paul Levesque books the wrestling, you like, you can't you can't blame him for this. That's total bullshit, and you'd have to be incredibly naive to make that argument. And it honestly bothers me a lot because I think 
it's people allowing the person that does this thing that they like for entertainment purposes to get in the way of like right and wrong and justice. Um, and as a journalist, I have a major problem with that personally. Um, speaking of journalism, got the Royal Rumble weekends right now. And there's, from, from what I know, there's still going to be a press event after the Royal Rumble. I know there was a press event going on right now. I saw some of our members of, of wrestling media were taking pictures of themselves on like this red carpet with the Royal Rumble background. Um, all just, just super glad and pumped to be at the WWE Royal Rumble, the first stop on the road to WrestleMania. Uh, not like there was an earth shattering story that broke about this company uh, yesterday. It's it's all it's all roses and, and rainbows um, for some of these people. But we're going to have this press conference, I guess, after the Royal Rumble. And absolutely, people should be asked about this. Absolutely, people should be the first question anyone is asked, especially when Paul Levesque is giving a press conference, is what did you know about this? When did you know? And why didn't you do anything about it? And I don't care if Paul Levesque says, oh, I don't have... Uh, any comment on that, or I can't comment that on that. If Paul of X says, I'm not going to be commenting on that, and I will not be answering any questions about that, people should continue to ask questions about it, okay? Paul of X is there to answer your questions. If he wants to just keep saying, I can't answer that, I can't answer that, then that's fine, because that's at least going on the record about saying anything. Don't be deterred by him just saying, oh, I can't answer that, so I'm not going to get a good answer. Um the whole point of these things is supposed to be to get information from these people. When a giant story breaks, and this is a giant story, and they're going to hold a press conference two days after that story breaks, it's time to ask some serious questions. It's time to put on the big boy pants and the big journalism cap and actually ask some questions. Because there's some people out there. There's your John Alba's. And there's Nick Houseman. And there are these people out there that fancy themselves real journalists that want to lecture people on proper journalism. I've seen Cameron Hawkins tweets over the last few days where apparently he's like the king of wrestling journalism. And he's here to tell us all, oh, well, you guys can say that, but you're not part of this. When you're part of journalism, you'll really understand. Like he's like this king of the mountain that can give us all these things. That guy doesn't know fucking shit about anything. But there are these people out there that want to talk, oh, this is this is the right thing to do. You know what the right thing to do is? Is to ask Paul Levesque these questions tomorrow when he steps up with that presser. That's the right thing to do. And anyone that doesn't do it is a coward and shouldn't be in that room. Because this is the only story that matters. Don't care about who wins the Royal Rumble. Don't care if The Rock comes back. Don't care if they have the main event for WrestleMania set up. This is the only story that matters tomorrow. And if Paul Levesque can stand up there at that press conference and not answer any questions like that, then every single person that gets to ask a question in that room should no longer be asking any questions in the future to any wrestling personality. Because the entire thing is a sham. And it's these people that are masquerading as serious media members that at the end of the day, don't possess the skill, don't possess the curiosity, and don't pos possess the intelligence to understand what really is going on here and what the real story is. And they might say, oh, my readers don't really care about that. Well, whose fault is that, that your readers don't care about anything that's actually important? that's your audience, whose fault is that? The reason they think that, the reason they feel that way is because the audience that you have cultivated is a bunch of incurious morons. And maybe that gets you some likes on Twitter. Maybe that gets you some retweets. Maybe it gets a couple super chats. But your work is meaningless. And your work isn't worth the, the file data that it's being recorded in.
that's like an old newspaper joke. Like your work isn't worth the paper it's printed on. But most of these people aren't printing anything these days. So I had to change the reference on the fly. But that's what the real focus should be on tomorrow. These people that want to lecture us on proper journalism. And I say this as someone that's lecturing on it. But I can tell you that if I was there, that would be the first thing I'd ask would be about this. Um, some helpful advice. Ask a blunt, direct question that is in as many words, as, as few words as possible. Because I see a lot of the people like proposing like, this is a question you should ask. And it's kind of this long, like, given that you were a member of the board of directors and given that you were a member that was part of this investigation, what do you feel about, you know, it's like this, this, this is like a hundred word question. I would just be as blunt as possible, no wiggle room, and just be like, Hullabeck, are you disturbed by these allegations? That Vince, of Vince McMahon's sex trafficking that broke yesterday, like like ten words or less. I was uh, I saw uh, uh, John Pollock, who I like and respect greatly. He uh, had the question about Dana, to Dana White last weekend, where he asked Dana White about uh, Sean Strickland's you know very homophobic comments that he made, and John did make the mistake by using too many words because he said. I know, Dana, you've been giving a lot, you know, you, you can give talent a long leash. And then Dana kind of used that as an out to kind of go on a free speech rant about uh, to, to, to John to kind of get out of answering the actual question. Like if my advice to John in that situation would be, I would just ask Dana the most blunt question possible, which would be, are you concerned about Sean Strickland's homophobic comments? Because that doesn't give him the wiggle room to get out of it. So that's the question that I would just, that's the recommendation I would give if anyone is listening to this. That would be my recommendation would be if you're going to ask a difficult question, you're going to ask a serious question about this, ask it in as short and as blown as a way as possible, because that's the easiest way to get direct information. It doesn't allow for wiggle room. If Polovec wants to say no comment, that's fine. Other people given press, I don't know who else is going to be at that press conference. I, I don't know how fair it is to ask talent about that. Um, I'll tell you one person who might be at the press conference that you could probably ask a question is Paul Heyman. No one's talked about Heyman, but for all intents and purposes, Heyman is very close with Brock Lesnar and was probably directly involved in Brock Lesnar's contract renegotiation with WWE. And that's all over this lawsuit. So I wouldn't be, I would consider asking him as well what he knew about that. Because he might just say no, and he's Paul Heyman, he's a super big scumbag, so he'll probably just beat around it or anything. Um, but like, I don't, know, I, I don't know if I'd ask Cody Rhodes about it. I don't know if I would ask, you know, Rhea Ripley or someone. I don't I don't know how totally fair that is. But outside of Paul Levesque, some person that should probably be asked about is Paul Heyman. Because his boy is 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 all over that that um that court case. Um so I'm gonna wrap it up. Like I said, pretty short episode. Um I'll have another episode actually coming out in a couple of days that's not related to this at all, but wanted to get something uh, recorded and on the record. Um, we'll see what happens over the next few days. Could be a pretty explosive next few days. Could be an interesting next few days. Um, but thanks a lot for everyone who listens. And I will talk to you again after a while. Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. <laughs>